a matter of life and death. But I can perform this miracle. World War II would be over. Our boys would come home. That's happening, isn't it? The world will remember this day. Our work here will ensure a peace mankind has never seen. Until somebody builds a bigger one. I wanted the film to have the momentum of a, of a thriller. It's a suspenseful story. Uh, it has more radical twists and turns and, and peculiar coincidences and things going on than any fictional story I've ever tried to come up with or dealt with myself. Um, and I wanted to really get that across. Theory will take you only so far. What I really needed to do was take the audience and put them into Oppenheimer's head so that we experience what he experienced. We make the decisions he made. We understand him rather than judge him. Chris was very clear from the first time we talked about it that this entire thing was gonna live and die on the back of Killian Murphy, that that performance is absolutely central, and that, in fact, he wrote the script in the first person to give us, you know, the crew and the cast and the understanding that this is gonna be what the movie feels like. This is gonna be like a journey through this man's mind. We imagine a future, and our imaginings horrify us. You know, for a conventional protagonist, he starts here, an event occurs, he changes his attitude and he ends up here. Whereas with Oppenheimer, it was very, very much like this, you know, and very, very contradictory and kind of uh, unpredictable. Um, Chris used this great phrase at the beginning of our journey, and he said he, 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 he likened Oppenheimer's uh, approach to kind of morality as be like dancing between the raindrops, and that was very useful to me. I've worked with Killian before, so we do have a sort of history and secret language with each other now. I, I love him, would love to work with him on everything. And I think there's a lot of trust there. But truly the scenes that I had with Killian were very raw and emotional. It's almost like all of these characters around Oppenheimer, you, you get to tease out different sides to the spectrum of the person. And I think his scenes with Kitty were like very much what it looks like when the sky goes dark. Like, what does this man look like? And the exploration of the true trauma on his, on that brain, like living with a brain like that. I've always loved trying to portray the kind of internal landscape of a character non-verbally. You know, to me, that's, that's what screen acting is. And in this script, Chris had written in all these kind of cutaways to what we think might be the interior of, of Oppenheimer's imagination, or it could be sort of physics at work in the universe. For me, once you're in his head, once you've seen the origin of his relationship with the quantum world, the way he's visualizing it, the way he's almost threatened by this power to sort of see into dull matter, see energy residing there in this new way, following on from the discoveries of Einstein, you get into the middle act and it's a heist movie, you know. I mean, you're, you're dealing with the ultimate, uh, putting a team together, trying to figure out in this desperate race against the Nazis to unleash the power of the atom first. Let's go recruit some scientists. What I found so fascinating was all of these physicists, it's such a small world. You know, brains like this are so unique that, and they come from all over the world, that they kind of cross these borders and it's like they, they all know each other, right? So this handful of people are very familiar with each other, they studied together. And so Oppenheimer was in a unique position to, to um, understand and instruct Groves. Somebody is going to bring this weapon into the world and it's better that it's us than them. I know what it means if the Nazis have a bomb. I love the dynamic, particularly between me and, and Matt, me and, because we are very much the kind of, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the odd couple and the, the kind of duo. And I don't think they liked each other necessarily, but they needed each other. They have a 12 month head start. 18. How could you possibly know that? Groves desperately needed Oppenheimer to achieve a bomb, and, and Oppenheimer needed Groves' uh, logistics and his logistical skill, and, and 
and really that mentality. I mean, uh, Oppenheimer would have been too permissive. That that tension that existed between the military and the and the scientists is very interesting because the military is obsessed with secrecy and compartmentalization, and as they should be. This is life and death. This is talking about an existential weapon that they're building. They don't want any of this to get out. Action! Chris works on this, on this big scale, on this giant canvas and his films, you know, are, um, spectacles in many ways. But in all my six movies working with Chris, I never really think of them as big, ginormous sets and set pieces and explosions. I always think of them as me and Chris and the actors in a room, one camera and the boom op, and the, no monitors, no video village, nothing like that. And it becomes a kind of a laboratory, a very safe and private and intimate laboratory, you know, where you're able to explore and, and um, find things and fail, and that's, they're the best environments to work in. What Killian brings is the charisma and empathetic nature of a great actor who can open his mind, his heart to the audience and, and bring them into his, his state of mind. And so we needed to take the audience, and so we used large format film to do this with its higher resolution and increased clarity. We try and push our way through his eyes and into, into his head in a pretty physical manner with this giant IMAX camera just inches from his nose. Chris does make all of the chaos go away, like all of the noise. It wasn't like anyone walked around thinking, feeling like they were in an important movie. Like, it's not the vibe on set. And he's very casual, almost, you know, and he just, he speaks quietly. There's no... There's just none of that bedlam that you're normally having to kind of override on a film set to get into a zone. Everyone's in a zone. Everyone was so focused. And the unusual part of him is that, you know, he is this visual giant, but he's just as interested, curious, and um, specific about the acting as well. The, the, the performances are just as integral, you know, in his movies. I think that's why you see that rare mix in his films that they're, they're so entertaining and they're huge, sweeping movies, but these very intimate relationships at the core of it. He's just as interested in both. Three, two, one, zero. Chris is an analog filmmaker. That's what he believes in. He believes there's an emotional connection to, to real practical effects, uh, much more so than there is with um, computer-generated effects. And, you know, I've been over in so many films with Chris, like been on that boat out in the middle of nowhere in, in Dunkirk and up on top of a mountain in a whiteout snowstorm in Inception. And he believes that the, if you put the performance in that environment, that naturally they're going to respond in a much more truthful, honest, kind of viscerally energetic way than they would if they were in a sort of green screen environment or, or a set. And in this movie, every single location was a real uh, location. There was no set builds in the movie. So we were in Oppenheimer's house and we were in, uh, we were in Fuller Lodge in Los Alamos. So there's, a, there's some, some energy that comes off those walls. There's some kind of vibrations. There's some stories that they tell you. You don't get to work like that that often. It's not fully realized for you. And I think because we feel it, I think you guys feel it, I think it's the same watching Tom Cruise do stunts. You are sucked into it because you know he's doing it. And it's more nightmarish. And I think Oppenheimer and when the bomb goes off, it is scarier. It's more nightmarish because you know it's real. Why would we go to the middle of nowhere for who knows how long? Why? Why? How about because this is the most important thing that ever happened in the history of the world? When I first read the script, it, it was really overwhelming. It's very intense. And I, and I said to him, God, wh how, how is it that my mind played this trick on me that, you know, the Cold War ended and I went, you know, my, my brain just said, ah, this isn't a problem anymore. You can get on with your life. And, um, and uh, you know, obviously it's absurd. You know, the, the threat didn't go anywhere. And as we started shooting, the, you know, the war in Ukraine broke out and suddenly it was... She'd like a switch was flipped and everybody was talking about it again. What launched Chris into this whole thing in, in the first place and it got him interested was this idea that they weren't entirely positive they wouldn't ignite the atmosphere, that it wouldn't create a chain reaction that literally spread around the world and just annihilated human beings, just wiped us off the face of the earth. And, um, and they went ahead with the tests. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world? Chances are near zero. Near zero. So for me, 
It's about my desire to be in that room and as an audience member, bring myself and other audience members into that room to be there for that moment where they, they went ahead and did that because it's one of the great dramatic moments in history.